When I was little, it was just my mom and I in this tiny tiny house in a small town. I have a freakishly good memory, so I can clearly remember the layout of my tiny room, which was a laundry room from the previous owners. It was long and narrow, with just enough room for my crib against one wall and a window high up on the other. Now, I've always hated windows at night. I won't look out them. I keep the curtains shut or run past them. My fear has always been that I'll look out and see a face staring right back at me. After a bad breakup in my early 20s, I moved back home with my mom and after she observed this behavior, I told her my weird paranoia. She kind of laughed and proceeded to tell me when I was about two, I would scream and scream that there was a man in my window. I had nightmares, so she didn't really think much of it until one night she came in to shut me up and there he was, a man staring in the window. I looked at her like she was nuts. How could I not have known this? Then she continued to tell me that the man was the father of one of my really good friends growing up. He was known for peeping into single women's windows. She also didn't tell me I had a benign heart murmur and when the doctor discovered it once again in my early 20s, that scared the hell out of me too. This took place when I was about 10 years old. My mom had rather quickly filed for divorce, but she only had a part-time job and made very little money, so finding a place to stay that was affordable and available immediately was very tough. A friend of hers told her that she and her husband had a little mobile home that was currently sitting empty and that we could rent it practically for free until we figured out something else. I immediately didn't like the house. Part of this I'm sure was due to my parents abrupt divorce and having my life turned upside down, but it was also just the way the house itself was. We lived in a mountain town and this mobile home was way up a steep mile long driveway. Beautiful pine trees surrounded it, but the house itself, well, it looked abandoned and out of place. It had two bedrooms and two bathrooms. So my brother and I shared a room and my mom took the bedroom with the attached bathroom. It was a very 70s home with wood paneling and dated fixtures. There were also areas that showed strange damage like holes in the wall that were badly patched up. For whatever reason, I immediately refused to use the hallway bathroom. I wouldn't even step into it. My mom never really asked me why or questioned it, but let me use her bathroom. Anyways, my mom was gone a lot trying to find whatever work she could, so I would be home alone a lot after school and on the weekends. Each time I received a 911 call, I was by myself. My mom always told us not to answer the door, but we should always answer the phone in case it was her. So when the phone rang one afternoon, I figured it would be my mom since no one else really had our number yet. There was a woman on the phone who sounded very concerned. Hello, this is 911 returning your call. We received your call, but we got disconnected, the woman said. I immediately got a sick feeling. I told her that I did not call 911 and she asked me if there was anyone else in the house who might have called. I told her that I was home alone, but I started to get really worried that maybe I wasn't. She said that she would dispatch police or address just to make sure that everything was okay. At that point, I was very terrified to be in the house. So instead, I sat out and nervously waited for the police who showed up in about 15 or 20 minutes. The officer asked me if I had called 911 and I said no, but they claimed that I had called them. The officer just sort of shrugged and said, this kind of thing sometimes happens. They say that it can't, that the numbers can't get mixed up, but it does happen. He did a cursory glance around the outside of the house and then left. I tried to convince myself that the officer was right. It was just a mix up phone call and hopefully Whoever did actually call got the help they needed. About a month later, the same thing happened. I got another phone call from 911 
saying that they had received a phone call from my number. I told them again that it must have been a mistake. The woman on the phone scolded me a bit, telling me that 911 wasn't something to play around with and was preventing people from getting help. She didn't dispatch any police this time. Again, I was really worried someone was in the house, so I cautiously checked and made sure that all the doors were still locked. I don't know why, but I always kept the hallway bathroom door closed, maybe because of the eerie feeling I got from it. As I was checking the house, I just knew someone was in that bathroom. I was terrified. Part of me felt that I needed to open the door to check, maybe to prove myself wrong, but I was too afraid. So I just sat in the living room, watching that door. It was so quiet in the house that after a few minutes, I swore I started to hear faint little sounds coming from inside, like a kind of shuffling noise. I asked my mom to check the bathroom when she got home and she quickly looked inside. She made me come and look to see that it was empty and I was letting my imagination get the better of me. The 911 calls happened three more times over the coming months and only when I was home alone. The fourth time, the dispatcher told me I could face criminal charges for what I was doing and they would contact my parents. I hung up the phone sobbing and terrified. I had that feeling like someone was in the house again, but if I called 911, they probably wouldn't even show up. I felt like the girl who cried wolf, only it wasn't me. It was like someone was playing a horrible, twisted joke on me. I sat and watched the bathroom door again, hearing noises like someone dragging their fingers across the door. I decided my mom was right. I was probably just letting my imagination get away. I decided to try and leave the bathroom door open so I wouldn't get so freaked out by the thought that someone was in there. Then I got the fifth 911 call. This time though, after I hung up the phone with the dispatcher, the bathroom door slammed shut. I ran. I ran all the way down our steep driveway and found a place to wait till my mom pulled up into the drive. When she arrived, she was angry with me for leaving the house, but she saw how upset I was. I think maybe she thought that I was acting out due to the stress of the divorce. I refused to be alone in the house again though, so we worked it out so I would stay later at school or go to a nearby friend's house till she got off work. Not very long after this, we got a notice from my mom's friend that we needed to move out of the house because her mom needed a place to stay. I was so grateful to be moving out. I told my mom she needed to tell her friend that something was wrong with that house. But my mom thought it was a ridiculous way to pay back someone's generosity. I moved around a lot the next few years and tried to forget about that house. It wasn't until I was older that I really thought about it. I witnessed an accident and had to call 911 and the fear and paranoia all came flooding back. I decided to do some research which honestly I wish I had never done. A few years before we moved in, a woman was killed in that house in some kind of domestic dispute. It was days though before she was found, shut up in the bathroom. This happened almost 10 years ago. I was in high school, the summer before my senior year. I was your typical angsty teen who couldn't wait to get out of the burbs and go to college. I got a job at the big movie theater in my town. It wasn't too bad, I sold tickets or manned the concession stand. The best part of the job was getting to see all of the movies for free. I would come in even in my days off and see whatever was playing. I didn't have many friends back then, so this was a great way for me to kill time and not to focus on my lack of a social life. I worked the early shift on most weekdays and got to know the matinee crowd. Mostly, it was older folks who complained about the stale popcorn. It was during one of these shifts I first met Brian. He stood out from the usual crowd because he was younger, maybe late 30s, and quite handsome. He came several times a week 
and saw almost as many movies as me, always carrying some sketch pad into the theater with him. He was always friendly with me. After one of my shifts, I popped into a theater to catch the second half of some CGI movie. On my way out, I ran into Brian. He asked what I thought of the movie and we started talking. After maybe 10 minutes of conversation, I asked about the sketchpad. He told me he was an illustrator of children's books and was taking some time off between projects. He came to the movies for inspiration. I asked to see some of his work and he nervously showed me what he had sketched during this movie. They were hysterical. He put the cartoon characters in bizarre and dark situations. I told him I loved them and he said he would show some more. From then on, Brian came in more often. Seeing him was the best part of my shift. I would tell him what movie to see and ask for specific drawings. The darker, the better. My favorite one had the rat from Ratchet Lee cooking his human friend and serving him to guests. I could tell he loved showing them to me. I know our friendship could sound sketchy with him being an older guy and me a high school student, but I really felt we were just two awkward people that clicked. He treated me like an adult and never did anything inappropriate. One day, towards the end of the summer, Brian came in when I was working the evening shift. We were really busy, so I didn't get to talk to him much before he went into his movie. A group of girls from my high school came up to the concession. Their leader was Michelle. She was the most popular, pretty and athletic girl in school. On top of all of that, she was very nice. I hated her at the time, but looking back, it was obviously just jealousy. I don't blame anyone for not wanting to be friends with me, given my crappy attitude. When they came to the counter, I panicked and hid. I called over my co-worker and he took care of them. Later on, Brian came to see after the movie got out. He said he saw me run away from those girls. I was so embarrassed that he saw that. I panicked and made up an excuse. I said, those are just the mean girls at school. They try to make my life hell. I don't really care. I just didn't want to deal with it today. Brian got a very serious look, more serious than I had ever seen him before, and told me, don't worry, bullies always get what's coming to them. Brian didn't come around over the next few days, and I was a bit relieved because of how stupid I acted the last time. One evening, I came home from work, and my mom told me I received a large letter, probably an information packet from a college. I opened it up and found the sketchbook, immediately recognizing it as the same type Brian always carries. Before I opened it, I started thinking how weird this was. How does he know where I live? If he wanted to show me his drawings, why not just do it in person like always? I flipped to the first page, which had the words, an invitation, in big fancy font. The next page showed a young girl tied to a chair. It was Michelle. She looked terrified. All of Brian's drawings, even the most gory ones, were whimsical and cartoonish. This was photorealistic. Two dark figures in masks approached her. They pulled out knives, and I couldn't keep turning the page. It was stomach churning. I forced myself to keep reading, looking for answers, until I reached a horrible end. After Michelle was long since dead, the two figures removed their masks and were revealed to be me and Brian. The last page just said, RSVP, soon. I didn't know what to do, so I did nothing. The next day I tore up the book and threw it out in the dumpster outside the theater and went to work like nothing had happened. I waited in dread that day for Brian to come in, but he never did. The next week, I was working the ticket counter and saw him approaching from the parking lot. I froze. Before he opened the door, he stared at me. I was petrified and felt all the blood draining from my face. After what felt like minutes, he shook his head, turned around, and walked away. I never saw him again.
My good friend, let's call her Jane, to protect her identity, told me her ghost story last year. And since then, it has been confirmed to me by several people who were around at the time. It took place back in the late 90s when she was in her early 20s. Jane was living on a farm with some other folks around her age because they were trying to back to the land type situation post college. Most of their neighbors were really friendly and helpful. Lots of old ladies making food for them and former coal worker guys who would help around the farm. There was one particular neighbor named Jim who was known to be a former meth addict but was cleaned up and acted as sort of a paid handyman around the farm. The farm was really old, including the main house, which was built in the early 1900s. Each of the people who lived there had their own room, including Jane, who took the room closet to the front door of the house. Eventually, one of the neighbors told Jane and her friends that the house was rumored to be haunted by a ghost of a man who lived there in the 1930s. Jane and her friends never really took it seriously but they would joke around and try to scare each other in a pranking way. One night though, Jane woke up because she felt the presence of something unusual in her room. She opened her eyes and could see a dark, ghostly figure standing silently in the doorway, staring at her. She repeatedly told the figure to leave, saying, You need to go now. I do not want you here. Eventually, after a few minutes, the figure left. She didn't tell any of her friends because she didn't want them to freak out or think that she might be crazy. Anyways, a few days later, one of the other ladies who lived in the house told Jane that the ghost had appeared at her doorway and had actually come into her room, but she had laid in her bed silently in response. Jane then confessed the same thing had happened to her earlier, except the ghost left when she told it to leave. The ghost continued to appear to Jane occasionally, but she would just tell him to leave, and he would. That autumn, they had to stop paying Jim, the handyman, because they were running out of funds and couldn't afford to have him around. Angry, he turned on the farm people and started doing terrible things to the farm, including vandalizing the barn, messing up the garden, etc, etc. They never had proof that it was him, so the police couldn't really do anything, but they were convinced he was the one doing it. One horrible morning in the middle of winter, Jane came outside and saw that the farm dog was hanging from a tree. They all assumed it was Jim who had done it and they called the police, but Jim wasn't in his trailer up the hollow. It looked like he had skipped town. When spring came, the snow started melting and one of the neighbors found Jim's body in a creek that had been covered in snow for a while. The police investigated and surmised that Jim had been high in drugs, fallen into the creek, hit his head and froze to death. He died around the same time the dog was killed. Anyways, the creepiest part of the whole thing was that Jane realized that the ghost had stopped appearing to her around the time that Jim went missing, but didn't put two and two together until they found his body. She told me that now she's pretty sure that it was Jim standing in her doorway silently at night. And that, in my opinion, is so much more creepier than a ghost. So that's it for today's Halloween special. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like. Until tomorrow, goodbye.